and, and we will be sharing this with a wider group. And also we ask that um, for those uh, communications focal points that we have on the webinar and for all of you others who are on Twitter and Facebook, um, please use your hashtags, um, which you will be able to see here. So you can use a hashtag Girl in, Girls Inspire or hashtag and Child Marriage. And you can also um, uh, post any comments on the community of practice on girlsinspire.org. So without any further delay, as we wait for other people to come in, um, I'd like to, to pass it on to Ms. Frances Ferreira, who is the Senior Advisor for Women and Girls and the Team Leader for Education here at the Commonwealth of Learning, to make her opening remarks. Um, thank you, um, I'm speaking to you. It seems I'm struggling to get into the webinar, so I'm speaking by chat to you. Thank you so much, um, Sharice, for organizing this webinar. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this is very important to us that we have webinars such as this. And today we have a very accomplished uh, presenter. Presenter, Rosanne Wong. She is our data equality manager. Rosanne has been with the Congress of Learning for just um, under three years. Um, and uh, she has more than a decade of experience in international development in various sectors, uh, but more importantly in gender, mainstream, human rights. Uh, which are two of the more crucial areas in our work in working on and she has worked for various UN agencies prior to joining all and also for the government. Um, Roseanne, thank you very much for making time to speak to us today on this very important subject. In fact, our opening webinar for Girls Inspire. We are very excited to, to, to listen to you and also to, to interact with you and to ask questions. Um, thank you so much and welcome. Uh, over to you, Shirley. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, I'll pass it on to Ms. Roseanne Wong. Thanks, Cherie. Thank you, Francis, for the warm welcome. Um, good morning and good evening to all of you. Um, it's always a pleasure to engage with our colleagues in the field. From sunny Vancouver this morning, I greet you. Um, I'm going to launch right into the uh, presentation part of the webinar. Um, I think that the focus of this webinar, at least from my understanding, is that the, the greater focus will be on the latter part, which is the discussion part, learning from each other and learning in, about the ways that you are mainstreaming gender in your own communities and organizations. The beginning part of the presentation will look at a definition of gender equality, gender equity, look at gender parity and its relationship to learning. I will share Cole's approach to gender mainstreaming, our definition, which is really shaped by our own institutional context and the communities that we serve. And as I mentioned, um, a discussion at the end on um, your own experience in the field in main, excuse me, mainstreaming gender. And perhaps um, I may pause at particular sections to ask if any comments or questions at that time and then we can proceed to the discussion part at the end. Um, I want to begin with a definition of what is gender equality as this is core in the work that you are doing um, to end child early and forced marriage. But before being able to talk about that, it's, it's difficult to not address or not talk about the definition of gender. Um, and I just wanted to say that gender is socially determined. It's something that is assimilated and learned. Um, it is the way that a society views the roles, responsibilities, behaviors, and characteristics of women and men, boys and girls. These roles and behaviors and characteristics can change over time and they will vary within a culture. So gender equality, according to the 
the text here is equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities. It is equitable access to education, employment, and livelihoods options. And I want to stress that gender equality is not equal to women and girls. Um, it is about creating equal conditions so that both males and females can fulfill their human potential and contribute to economic and social development. A case in point is cool at this moment, we are in our own approach to gender equality. We are looking at boys in the Caribbean who at this moment are actually falling behind in uh, primary and secondary education and at the tertiary levels falling, uh, dropping out. And Cole is working hard now to help bring those boys back to education and learning. So I just wanted to give you a concrete example of how we are looking at gender equality um, at Cole. One of the colleagues in the pre-webinar mentioned gender discrimination. Um, and I just wanted to touch upon that. Gender discrimination is very much, um, it works very much against gender equality. And it's about anything any action that denies a right or opportunity to an individual based on a person's gender. And this brings us to the idea that gender roles or relationships in society between males and females involves power relationships. So in any society, we have a division of labor um, where men and women are assigned certain roles in a society based on, and I highlight, perceived characteristics and attributes instead of ability and skills. So for example, women and girls are often um, assigned to household or child raising responsibilities, not necessarily because they are better at this, but because society expects them to do those particular roles and functions. But the consequence is that because women and girls are often in the private domain and working at homes, um, and less involved in decision making in the wider society, they will have different, less access and control to resources and decision making processes in the greater society. So understanding this is important, particularly in the work that you're doing to end child early and forced marriage, is that not only are we, are you working to enable girls and, uh, to study, that's a practical need, you're fulfilling their basic need to education, but there's unequal power relationships in a given society, often, and not always, but often in favor of males. So therefore, the idea is that gender roles is indicative of unequal power relationships. So that brings me to you know, the question of why is gender equality important after discussing all of this? And I wanted to quote Kofi Annan, who most of you will know as the previous UN Secretary General in 2006, he said, it is impossible to realize our goals, and I think here he's referring to social, economic, political goals, while discriminating against half the human race. So to support what he said, we have research and statistics saying that 70% you know, of the world's poor are women and girls, um, and that basically if half the population is restricted or have limited access to resources, to better their lives, the community, social, and economic development will be limited. I think I want to pause at this moment to ask if there are any questions or queries about what I just said so far, maybe any clarifications needed, comments. If you have any questions, please type in the chat box. Okay, we're not receiving any comments um, or questions in the chat box, so I assume we can proceed. Okay. So um, in the pre-webinar, um, one of the colleagues raised the issue of gender equity and wanted to hear from us as to the difference between gender equality and gender equity, and I think it's important. 
gender equity is about being fair to both males and females. Because males and females have different situations, as I just explained, the different roles in a society, different access to resources, different opportunities, different solutions are needed to compensate for disadvantage. So the idea is that if we're fair to both, equity will lead to equality. That is a relationship. And it's the inequality creating the unequal opportunities that we need to rectify that with different measures. As far as gender parity is concerned, um, I want to talk about this in the context of learning and education. Um, if you recall, most of you will, might know the Dakar Framework for Action in 2000. Um, in that particular uh, discussion, the international community set some basic goals, the goals for meeting the learning needs of every child, youth, and adult by 2015. And though now we are in 2016, many of those things are still relevant and valid today. So the two gender-related goals in, uh, from, from the Dakar Framework for Action are gender equality and gender parity. So gender equality in, con in the context of learning is ensuring that there is educational equality between boys and girls, whereas gender parity is about achieving equal participation of girls and boys in all forms of education. And these goals were set in 2000, and now with the Sustainable Development Goals the post-2015 era, these goals have now been um, taken a different form, but essentially they're the same goals of gender equality, gender parity within the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 4 and 5. So when we talk about achieving parity, we're talking about achieving equal participation of males and females in learning and education, we are arguing that if we do this, it will facilitate parity in livelihoods opportunities. It will also facilitate parity in leadership and decision making so that women and girls, um, males and females, will be at the same decision making table later on. Um, what you're doing in your work to eliminate CFM, child early and forced marriage, will help to facilitate parity because you're creating environments to enable girls to learn. You're also working to create mechanisms to support livelihoods so that they can be independent and be able to fulfill their human potential. So all the things that you're doing relate to gender parity. Um, I wanted to say though that, uh, actually I would like to quote the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has said that increased female education in developing countries can lead to better health employment outcomes and increase in women's decision-making power. So that brings me to Cole's priorities. Um, I wanted to share this with you because I think it's important for us to understand uh, the reason for Cole's approach and why we think uh, women's empowerment and gender equality is so important to us. Um, Cole recognizes that advancing the goals of women's empowerment and gender equality is central to our agenda, learning for sustainable development. And that's because Cole believes that learning is the key to individual freedom. It brings empowerment by giving access to learning for individuals. We're helping them to make decisions and choices. We're helping increase their ability to act and influence the lives and the decisions that affect them. Uh, including jobs, uh, social inclusion, and help them to fulfill their human potential. So learning for us is the key to achieving sustainable development. And in terms of gender mainstreaming, I just wanted to say that for Cole, um, gender equality and gender mainstreaming is a core part of our organizational culture, our values, and it's it reflected, as I will show in a few minutes, in all the work that we're doing. So. Um, just to give you the definition of gender mainstreaming, and I think it's important that in your own organizations that in order to define the way that you will approach gender mainstreaming, you must have a clear idea of how gender equality fits into your organizational values and the capacities and competencies you have within the organization to be able to do the things you'd like to do with regard to pursuing gender mainstreaming. Um, so for Cole, gender mainstreaming is a strategy and a process to ensure that gender equality is an integral part of policies, plans, and programs. 
So the idea is that before we take any decision or action, we must look at the potential effects of any action on girls, women, boys, and men before doing so. Um, so gender mainstreaming isn't about women taking action only or not only about women benefiting from it. We have a more holistic, balanced approach to gender mainstreaming. We see that both girls, women, men, and boys have their, we must take their views, experiences, interests, and needs and allow them to shape programs and policies and plans that we implement. Um, and the whole purpose of gender mainstreaming is not to treat boys and men and girls and women equal or the same. The idea is to facilitate equal opportunity so that they can have equal outcome. That is the idea. Any questions so far at this point regarding Cole's priorities and gender mainstreaming, our concept, uh, the way that we have defined it? Again, if you have any questions, um, please type it into the chat box and we'll try to address them. Also, um, we encourage you that if you're not speaking, if you could please mute your line by pressing on the green button. And if you'd like to speak, you just need to press on it again so you can unmute your phone and uh, ask your question. So I'm seeing a couple of comments saying that there's no question from the floor. We'll give it another. So um, we have a question asking what type of strategy Cole encourages? Is it a top-down or a bottom-up approach from Mustafa in Bangladesh Open University? Okay. Um, I think for us, Cole, we, it really depends on the organization that we are working with. And Cole works with a wide range of partners. Um, we work with non-governmental organizations, community-based groups, um, farmers. We work with policymakers as well as government officials. So the range of partners is quite vast and diverse. And so the approach to gender mainstreaming, the way that we see it is really about um, the, the partner that we're working with and the communities that organization serves. So if we're working with non-governmental organizations, community-based groups, the approach will be more bottom-up. And I'll give you an example of the boys project that I am working on, I referred to earlier in Jamaica. We really looked at the needs of the boys. We asked the boys what are the kinds of learning programs they're interested in, what are the skills that they like to learn. Um, we also looked at the labor market to see what kind of job offerings there are. Um, we also looked at the community, what kind of capacity the community has to um, develop programs that suit the learning needs of boys. So that's one example. The more policy level or higher level, um, top down as you called it, or you're referring to, that's how I interpret it, is working with government agencies and helping them to mainstream, if you will, uh, gender considerations into their own plans and policies, helping them develop, in some cases, institutional policies for gender mainstreaming. So we're taking a different approach depending on the partner we're working with. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions at this time? Okay. Um, I'm going to move on so we have time for a discussion. And this part of the presentation is, is going to be um, a little, I guess, uh, there's a lot of information, so I'm not sure I'll be reading all of it, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what we do with Cole. And I think the reason to sh for sharing this with you is that for us at Cole, if we really want to speak to gender mainstreaming, we really want to um, be able to promote it with our partners. I think the idea is that we need to have our house in order, if you will. Um, being, before being able to advance gender equality in the communities that we serve, and that's 53 member states, we need to ensure that we have enabling mechanisms internally to do, to walk the talk, as we say. So at Cole, we have different policies and practices. Um, to ensure that there's gender uh, equality um, taken into consideration. First is, for example, the way that we recruit staff and consultants, the way that we draw contracts, 
um, the way that staff is assessed in their performance, particularly senior management and program staff, gender responsiveness is part of that performance assessment. We have a harassment discrimination policy, and we work very hard to build the capacity of staff in gender awareness and gender mainstreaming in different ways. Um, so those are some of the examples of what we're doing to ensure that our policies and practices internally are gender sensitive or gender responsive. Next slide, please. As for our planning and programming, um, that's where you come in. Um, we look at gender equality, women's empowerment as part of our mandate and core values, as I spoke about. We have a gender policy um, established in 2007, and the way that this policy came about is really in consultation with the 53 member states. And this is important because when you're talking about developing a policy in your own communities, will be based on consultation with the communities that you serve. You know, that policy has to speak to the work that you're doing. Um, and we have a gender action plan. So we have a policy that sets the priority, our policy, um, a priority and our agenda. And then we have a gender action plan that um, helps to make that policy happen. It operationalizes that policy. We have resources allocated to make that policy happen. And we have an internal gender committee. Um, made up of a cross-section of staff from different departments and senior management that dis we discuss different issues including training for staff, we talk about um, different, we don't really talk that much about programming but it helps to steer the, the direction in which the organization is going um, in terms of gender. Um, and in 2013 um, this gender equality manager position uh, was created and the idea is that you know an organization in order to be able to speak to gender mainstreaming to be able to really pursue that. You really need to dedicate um, resources, both human and financial resources, for gender mainstreaming, or it's very difficult for that to happen. And the last is we do ensure that we are capturing gender-related results. So we have um, uh, made sure that we're collecting sex disaggregated data and that we're monitoring and evaluating any gender-related results that we set out at the beginning of our programming period. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, any learning and feedback that we gain from our monitoring and evaluation should go back into the program design later on. So the whole idea is to, it's a cyclical process, as most of you know, that are working in the field. Um, but I wanted to say also that we talked a lot about and our partners facilitating access to learning and training, but that is only one part of the picture because, um, you know, the learning and education is, is a tool, it's useful, it's a resource, um, it's a need that, uh, that we are working to fulfill to help empower individuals, as I said earlier. But in order to be able to change the power structure that I talked about earlier, that you know, gender relations are based on a power dynamic in order to tip the scale, if you will, and make it more a level playing field. There are other factors that are required. There are other enabling factors, and I'll just talk about those, um, which most of you may know, if you're, um, particularly those working in communities. Sociocultural norms are going to be a big factor in affecting whether or not gender mainstreaming is effective, legislation as well. Um, decision-making processes, employment opportunities, um, whether those are available. So that is more the longer-term changes that um, gender mainstream is aspiring to achieve. And um, so that, what I wanted to say, oh, okay. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to raise a question from the floor. Um, can you give an example? of gender equality clauses in contracts. And this question was raised by Safir Khan, um, from, who's the executive director at Bidari in Pakistan. Thank you for the question. Um, we have um, some standard gender equality clauses where in the consultant's contract, we will um, mention that um, the consultant and the products he or she delivers, the deliverables, must have a gender lens. Um, in practice, uh, it is important to it is important to have these clauses, but it's also important, I think, to be able to monitor 
the, the effectiveness of these clauses. And so um, that's something we're working on. I just gave you a, gen, a general clause. I'll give you a more specific clause that I have used in my own contracts. For instance, um, uh, we are asking partner organizations to develop learning materials. And we would like those learning materials to be gender responsive. And so one of the things I've created a tool, it's a checklist for developing gender responsive learning materials. And in my contracts, I have built in the uh, requirement of the consultant or the contractor to use this checklist to audit the materials that this organization or consultant will develop and ensure that it complies with that checklist. So that quality control in terms of gender responsiveness Gender, responses, gender responsiveness of learning materials is built into the contract. So that's one way of ensuring that. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. And I think uh, there was another comment. Um, I know Francis wanted to say something. Francis, would you like to go ahead? Cherise, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Francis. Thank you. OK. I had my struggles here to mute to unmute. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sharice. Uh, I wanted to add to what Roseanne was saying in regard the the contracts, the question on provision within our contracts. Um, but I want to tie it with uh, the previous discussion that ended the previous slide on uh, the last uh, bullet point data collection, monitoring, and evaluation. In fact, the slide is still up. Um, within the contract, we, for instance, uh, say specifically that you have to ensure uh, the attendance, etc., that you do have gender segregated, sex segregated data. So that is another example of how we make provision for it within the contract. But also um, where we make a reference to specific uh, policies, uh, for instance, the Canadian uh, policy on child protection. Uh, in, those, in those policies, you will see more more things coming up in regard to gender. But I think the, the issue of sex segregated data is a very important issue in order for us to ensure that we fill the gaps if there are gaps within a project. Um, and that is why it is so important. If you go to, for instance, the, the tools that we have developed, uh, while this is specifically focused on girls, uh, we have some tools that focus on the whole community where men and boys are also involved. Um, and so some of the questions in regard to girls um, is asking specifically about the environment in which uh, the schools are. Uh, is it gender sensitive? In other words, uh, is there provision for the needs for girls equally as there is provision for the needs of boys. Um, this question is not only asked to, to, to females, it's also asked to the community leaders. And in that way, we are sensitizing them on issues that they may be ignorant about. So in that way, we bring in the gender discussion uh, into the center. <clears throat> Thank you, Cherise. The other question that I wanted to ask was, uh, within this uh, discussion plane, do we not see what the other participants are asking? Because I cannot see the other questions. Well, I thought that I would be able to see the questions of other people also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Um, the questions are coming into the moderator's screen on GoToWebinar. And as they come in, um, we're addressing them one by one. Um, we've just had one come in from Mustafa from Bangladesh Open University asking, what about the implementation of the gender policies? How it is monitored? Okay. Um, with the gender policy, um, generally the policy is a, is a general direction in which an organization or institution is undertaking. Um, it sets out the parameters, what would you like to see, some of the objectives of the organization with regard to gender equality. Um, usually a gender action plan is setting out the timelines for achievement of, uh, it'll set out the res expected results, the timelines, the roles and responsibilities 
um, and when things will be monitored. So a gender action plan is, is um, one way of ensuring that your policy is being implemented. At COAL, we have the, an annual review of the Gender Action Plan. We set the indicators and expected results at the beginning of our program period, but every year as well we review our Gender Action Plan. We set the, the different uh, expected results for the different program areas and for the organization. Um, and then at the end of the year when we report to our Board of Governors, we will then go back and see how we've done. So it's one way of ensuring that we're accountable um, and can demonstrate certain results. Um, if you're curious, uh, the Gender Action Plan is actually available on the CO website, um, not this year's, but last year's. Um, perhaps later we can arrange to have the link sent to you so you can see, um, okay. see that. Yeah. Um, I, another further comment on that, Francis um, was wondering if Mustafa referred to the institutional policy that CO helped develop in Bangladesh Open University. Um, Mustafa, are you able to address that question? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, the, sometimes we say that uh, the institutions got the policies, but in terms of implementation, we don't see the results sometimes. So uh, it's better I, I learn something that uh, how to monitor these things. So gender action plan uh, can be used to to to. Uh, implement as well as to monitor the whole process. So thank you very much for uh, the, the response. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, the next comment that we have here is from Rafat Shuja from Bidari in Pakistan. Um, the comment is, sometimes when working with girls in community, it seems we have to sensitize and mobilize boys more than girls who are well aware of their rights but scared enough to claim it. So how do we do so? Rafat, would you like to expand on your question? Uh, hello. Yeah. Hi, Rafat. Yeah, I think, uh, Go on, we can hear you. Uh, okay. So I think, yeah, it's, it's true that, uh, uh, yes, uh, only if we focus on girls, I think the, the boys must be uh, 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 involved in the process. Otherwise, uh, sometimes uh, uh, the, the results are coming very slow. So if the boys are in, involved, if they do know the, the benefit of, uh, 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 of including the girls in the process, in the workplace, etc. So uh, that will uh, inspire them to work together. I think it's also important to involve the uh, boys also in the process. Okay. Thank you, Mustafa. Rafat, did you have any other comments further to that? Thank you, Charis. This is it. Uh, while we are working for the, like, uh, we are working with the same problem all over again. Uh, either we are living in the uh, high society or doing it the same uh, everywhere. But uh, uh, like, uh, when we are talking about gender parity, it, it, it does matter. Yeah, we are supposed to take it like that, if we are, that we have to take them in the same level to male and female of the society, we have to take them in the same level. So we have to bring them, to, uh, someone down and bring the, someone uh, little up to make the equilibrium in the society. So for how to create, if you are living in a uh, like very well uh, gender par parity, so, uh, sort of gender equality society, but we are having uh, quite a problem. So we learn and uh, we, we need some more ideas. So we are, I think somewhere we have to uh, teach our boys uh, to behave like a boy and that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Rafat. Um, another you. comment further to the discussion regarding the institutional policies. I think Francis also had a comment. Francis, would you like to expand on it? Okay, I'm not sure if um, Francis can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Um, yes, I wanted to respond that all can support institutions or countries to develop 
gender policies or whatever policies, quality assurance policies, OER policies, etc. However, when it comes to the implementation of the policy, unfortunately in that case the onus is on that institution or that country. Uh, we cannot really get involved into, into that and uh, that is why when we develop such policies we try to put controls in place to ensure that the policy is implemented and that, that ownership is there. But unfortunately we do not have full control over it because leadership at institutions it changes, uh, tomorrow there may be another leader or they can be the same leader but they may change their minds. So it is a bit of a difficult situation unless uh, it is a specific project where call is asked to support also the implementation phase. Um, it is sad sometimes for us to see after all the hard work that we have done to develop a policy that the policy is there but it, is, it doesn't love, it's not a loving document, it is just there for the sake of yes we have a policy uh, and this is what we try to avoid uh, with this kind of work of us that we say we encourage gender mainstreaming, um, we, we advocate for it and that is why we bring in uh, webinars such as this and we will go further and we say when an institution doesn't have a policy, uh, a gender policy, we want them, we want to support them to develop such a policy. But the policy should be um, a very practical instrument, tool that they can use. <coughs> uh, as Roseanne has said, the gender, the, the checklist that she has developed for looking at materials. So it should be something that you can use. Sometimes the policies are also not user friendly. It's a bit above the average user. So people don't really know how to use this policy. So if policies are less symbolic but more practical tools, um, it may be the direction that, that we want to suggest. Thank you, um, Sharice. Thank you very much, Frances. Um, we'll pass the, um, the presentation back to Roseanne uh, to close the presentation. Sure. I um, just have one last slide. Um, um, I just wanted to speak to the um, advocacy and communication part of the gender mainstreaming strategy that COLE is undertaking. We have uh, various tools to ensure that we are communicating um, to the world about the work that we are doing in gender mainstreaming. Um, these are some of the, the areas that you may go and visit. The Women in ICT and ODL webpage. Various resources are there. Um, we've got the gender <coughs> to subscribe to. And we have connections, which um, is our newsletter, quarterly newsletter, promoting gender equality through open and distance learning. And in all the communications that we have, whether it's presentations, speeches, or publications, we always ensure that the images and language and messages that we share are gender responsive. So this, um, this ends the presentation part of the webinar. Um, what I've presented just now with Cole is really uh, a snapshot of uh, the tools that we are using to ensure that the work that we do is gender responsive. I've talked about policies, practices, plans, programs, and advocacy and communication, and um, that's the presentation part. I'd like to move to the discussion part of this webinar and hear from your experiences, the challenges, the lessons learned, or any practical ways that you um, to mainstream gender in your own work. And I open the floor to any comments. Again, please feel free to um, type in your comments or questions in the chat box and we'll address them one by one. Alternatively, please feel free to unmute your phone and um, try to speak so that we can hear you.
So maybe I can ask um, to just jump start the discussion. Perhaps I can ask um, one of you as to what you're doing to mainstream gender in the work. So may I call upon um, Safir from Badari? Is there something that you'll be able to share on um, the work you're doing to mainstream gender? From anyone else, any other comments from anyone else on the work that they're doing? I know that you're doing work in the communities and some of you have raised some of the challenges that you've found. Perhaps that's the kind of thing that we'd like to hear and discuss um, from you. Sophia, I'm not sure if you're able to hear us. Um, if you are, please feel free to unmute your phone and speak. Um, I also know that we have Vanita from Mandeshi in India. Um, if there are any ways that you um, mainstream gender in your processes and your projects, feel free to share that with us as well. We also have Mrs. Hassan Banu from Center of Mass Education and Science in Bangladesh. Um, Mrs. Banu, please feel free to share what it is your organization does in terms of ensuring that um, girls and boys have equal opportunities and that gender is mainstream throughout your processes and projects. Sharice, uh, can I speak? Yes, Francis, please go ahead. Because I cannot see if there are questions coming in, so I will take the floor for the moment. Um, just to thank everybody who have participated in, in this webinar. Um, and I know um, one is not so comfortable to speak on these sessions, but uh, I want to encourage the participants who have joined us uh, this evening to feel free and share their experiences. Uh, here in Mozambique today, I, I say to some of the partners that I've worked with, um, although they think that they learn a lot from me, uh, they must know that we learn a tremendous lot from them. And it's very important that they are open and share with us. So don't think what you have done is insignificant. It is indeed huge. And uh, we can learn from you in other countries uh, and other partners can, can learn from you. I know all of you are doing a great job, um, so kindly share with us. Thank you, Cherise. Thank you, Francis. I see that um, we had a comment from Safir and Bidari that there's something wrong with the microphone, unfortunately. I'm sorry to hear that, Safir. If there are any comments that you'd like to share here, um, please do so and I can read it out for you. Alternatively, we, we encourage everybody to log back into the community of practice after this webinar and post their comments there in the discussion so we can continue this conversation. In the meantime, I have a comment um, from Vanita Shinde from Mandashi, who's a chief administrative officer from Mandashi organization. Um, she says, hello, we work for women. Our mission is empowerment. 90% of staff is women. We do not have gender policies at our organization. But good to know more about gender equality, and she sends her thanks to everybody. So thank you very much, Vanita, for sharing. Hello. Sophia, would you like to go ahead? Hello. Hi, Vanita. Hi. Hi, Vanita. Thank you very much for your comment. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Thanks. No. Thank you. Thanks. Safir, Hello. Would you like to try? There you go. Thank you very much, Safir. Sorry okay. about that. Oh, okay. Uh, I think it was muted and uh, I was trying to say something that uh, nobody could hear me. Okay. Uh, can you hear you? Can you hear? Uh, 
I don't I don't want to go into I mean lots of uh, a long discussion just a few quick points uh, interesting points that I can uh, share uh, we have a gender policy and we try our best to implement it uh, we are an organization that is focused on women and girls so um, gender and main gender mainstreaming is part of everything that we do that's actually the objective of the organization itself that's why Bedari was created uh, the challenge is, uh, the, I, mean, I think the biggest challenge is the uh, availability of the resources. Where you can make very good policies, but when it comes to implementing them, then you are uh, stuck with whether you have enough money to do that or not. So the, uh, I think that is usually the biggest challenge. Though there are other challenges, like in, uh, uh, when you go out into the community, these gender biases, this gender discrimination is so, um, it's so par it has become part of the culture. So changing it and doing things differently becomes really, really difficult uh, uh, when you try to do it, uh, especially when you go into the communities and you try to, um, like, uh, if, if uh, no, I mean, we go out into the community and we want to talk to women, we first have to uh, face men and get their permission to get access to their women. So uh, that, that's how the situation is. So we, I mean, uh, it, th this is kind of a lesson learned as well that you have to uh, engage men and boys as well, because if you don't engage them, you can't access women, and you can't change gender roles or improve things or change this um, the term uh, uh, somebody used just uh, a few minutes ago. This uh, power equation, the power equation between the two two genders. This this needs to be set right, and you need to work with both genders to set things right. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah, thank you so much for that comment, and I I appreciate it. Um, I think you've highlighted a very important point about the involvement of of community leaders and men to be able to um, implement gender mainstreaming or to look at these issues. Um, it's very key, and much of the research has shown us that um, the involvement of men and boys is crucial if we're really serious about um, the pursuit of gender mainstream and gender equality. So, and um, I myself cannot speak about the biases that you're talking about, but from what you're describing, it sounds to me that um, these biases are deep set um, and uh, very difficult to address, and it takes time to change. Um, and to work within this kind of uh, environment. Thank you, Safir and Razan. Um, I see Mevish from Bedari. I see that you've got your hand raised. Would you like to say something, Mevish? Hello. Hi, Mevish. Hello. Uh, I raised it earlier during the presentation. I just wanted to know uh, the role of internal gender uh, committee. Sorry, Mavish, could you repeat that, please? Um, there's a bit of noise in the background. I said that uh, I raised it earlier during the presentation. Okay. I just wanted to uh, know internal gender committee's role in Paul. Oh, okay. Our internal gender committee at Cole. Um, it is a, a committee headed by the president of the or senior management. So our president and vice president sit on that committee along with myself and staff members from a cross section of the organization. So we have representation of, at all levels. So we have administrative staff, program or senior staff. Um, colleagues with different functions. We have colleagues from knowledge management, human resource and finance, as well as from programs. So the idea is really that the committee is a tool not only to ensure that our gender policy is implemented because it oversees the implementation of the gender action plan. It is responsible for um, guiding the capacity building of staff at coal in gender mainstreaming, um, but also it provides a tool um, with which to raise awareness among staff um, because, as I just mentioned, we have staff from different 
uh, parts of the organization who normally may not be as involved in the program part of things, but they become aware and become sensitized through participation in this committee. So it's it's really um, a very powerful tool, um, and I highly encourage um, something like that. It's feasible within your own institutions to have. Hope that answers your question. Okay, um, our hour is coming to a close. We have one more comment from Vanita from Mandeshi. Um, Vanita, would you like to um, read out the comment regarding your uh, work with communities and women? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, so while working with women and while mobilizing them, we also face challenges like uh, women do not get family support. They do not, uh, family do not allow women to participate in the program workshop. So first we try to convince the family and once family understand the importance of the program, then they allow the women to participate in the workshop. So challenging the women to participating in the workshop and also their family. Uh, so we face challenge uh, convincing the women and the family to participate in the program is most challenging for us also. But we also saw once women uh, is successful, then family start to support her. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Benita. I just thought maybe could I just please ask a question about the way that you what kind of what kind of tools maybe you can tell us what kind of tools or approaches have you used to convince a family um, for women to participate? Have you used um, success stories or what kind of tools have you used to convince? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, like success stories of previous graduates that works a lot and that helps a lot. We also, what we do, we also organize meeting in the villages. We try to, uh, you know, uh, we, first we try to contact uh, SHG leaders, community leaders and uh, with the help of them, them we try to uh, reach the women. Excellent, thank you for that, thank you for sharing that. I think it's helpful for, for other colleagues as well. Thank you, Vanita and Razan. Um, we'll take one more comment from the floor, and then I'll invite uh, Ms. Frances Ferrer to make the closing remarks. Um, I believe, Mustafa, you put in a comment here. Would you like to expand on this? Okay, I'm not sure if Mustafa can hear us, but I'll just read out the comment here. Um, he said, I uh, okay. sorry, go ahead, Mustafa. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, actually, the main uh, problem happens is, uh, yes, if there is a policy somewhere, uh, 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 the policy is partially implemented or some in some places the policies are not cared for. But I think that the most important thing is if we have the role model from uh, a different gender perspectives of like if uh, at an institution we have some role models, uh, some uh, uh, female uh, leaders or whatever it is. So if the role models are there, so this will impact the whole community or society very much. So this is very important because whatever policy we, we take and the implementation is always so. So if there is some role models that they can uh, 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 just uh, create an impact the society so that other people can follow them. I think that will, that will work better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. And I see Fatima from SPARC, the Society for the Protection of the Rights of the Child in Pakistan, would also like to say something. Please go ahead, Fatima. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, first of all, I would just like to say hi to everybody. This is my first webinar. I've joined, replaced Mariam Kumro, previously who used to be the focal person for coal from Spark. 
Um, I am just uh, wanting to share a success story and the and a bit of a background to this success story. Um, in 2000, uh, Spark actually drafted a bill for bre for the protection of breastfeeding, and it wasn't just for breastfeeding the 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 draft that was uh, the the bill that was drafted by Spark. It was for women protection in in the office spaces, but uh in pakistan due to culture pressure and the other suppressing matters the 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 initial bill which was drafted for women protection in office spaces was not taken up so seriously as it was when it was correlated with child nutrition and uh, uh protection of child for that matter and linking the two so that bill got later on passed on by an ordinance, and now it's the prevailing law in Pakistan. Uh, but in Pakistan, if we're talking about women, uh, the women rights are more um, valued when in co in correlation with children's rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. That's great. Um, I know we also have some colleagues from the Center for Mass Education and Science in Bangladesh. We have Anika, Tasneem, we have Shariar, and we also have um, Mrs. Banu, Mrs. Hassan Banu, who's the executive director. Would any of you like to say something? Um, hello, Cheris, can I share? Hi, Vanita, yes. Anita. Yeah. As, as per our experience, it is uh, it is very important to make women famous. This helps indirectly in marketing her product. For this, we honor women in big ceremonies. We also publish successful entrepreneurs' stories in newspapers. We broadcast their stories through radio channel. Uh, local uh, uh, TV channel. It helps women to increase her self-confidence, also her respect in the community and family level. That's great. Thank you so much, Vanita. We hope that uh, other colleagues from different organizations can also learn from everybody's experiences today that they've shared. Um, I'll give it a few more minutes. I'm not sure if the technology um, from the office at uh, CMES, the Center for Mass Education and Science, is working in Bangladesh. I'll give it a few more moments, um, and then we'll hand it over to Francis to make the closing remarks. Okay. Um, Francis, would you like to go ahead um, to make the, the closing remarks? Thank you, Sheree. Um, thank you, everybody. First of all, a big thanks to, <clears throat> to you who are the participants, without, this, without whom this webinar wouldn't have been possible. Thank you. Um, we have had more than 20 people registering for coming on tonight, but um, Unfortunately, some people did not log in. So thank you so much for honoring your commitment. Um, then thank you so much, Sharice, for setting this all up and for facilitating it. Um, you've done a great job. And most importantly, Roseanne, for being our very gracious hostess and hosting this presentation. Um, uh, I hope we can make use of your services again next time. I think you have done a great job. Um, I wanted to say I know CMES, Ms. Vano and the team, uh, they are online but they didn't speak maybe because of technology. Uh, they do have a gender policy and I would have wanted them maybe at the next time or on the discussion to share with us how did it happen that they developed the policy, to share with us the process of the gender policy. Um, as Sophia has said, sometimes we don't have policies, but we have that commitment and we do it. But there are other institutions where if there's not a policy, nothing will happen. So sometimes we have to try both. 
So I want to congratulate um, um, Mandeshi for uh, broadcasting and then publishing uh, women. And I think uh, the other organizations are doing the same. But as Mustafa has said, we, ne we need role models. Um, and I think Mandeshi has put it clear that they are using success stories. When Roseanne asked what tools they are using to uh, to convince the communities to allow girls and women to get educated. Um, uh, I think one of the tools is indeed the role model um, model that you put that women out there and say they have achieved this, this success or that success uh, and that they in that way inspire uh, other women and that is why we are using Girls Inspire so that what the girl achieved will show or will serve as an inspiration to other girls. Um, Spark has done a great job uh, as uh, was um, narrated to us on the policy uh, that they have um, initiated in Pakistan. Um, and as I said, some of the other organizations that's online have done all great work. We didn't all have the opportunity now to share it or maybe because of technology. But I'm very excited about the discussion that just took place uh, for us to talk about these issues. Uh, one way of convincing boys and men uh, is to engage them, to involve them, to ask them what do they think, how do they feel. Um, earlier in the discussion, um, uh, most of us also ask, is it a top-down or a bottom-up approach which we are using? And Rosen um, eloquently responded by saying we are using um, like a participatory approach. It depends on uh, where we are, at what level we are working. And, and this is what we are doing also with Girls Inspire. Uh, we are using a participatory approach. We are working at any level whether it's at management level, at the community folk level, or uh, or at the grassroots level, uh, we have to respect the next person to have the same rights than what we have, and that input is as valuable as ours. And that is why it's so important that you share with us your stories. And great stories were shared with us tonight, and I'm very, very happy about this webinar. I'm looking forward to the next one. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your passion with us in this. Uh, we are looking forward to the next um, webinar. Thank you and um, good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.